My good friends Ken Gerhard from San Antonio, a famous Texas cryptozoologist. For some people, I want people, I want to make a note here that we do have Kyle Blackburn and Ken Gerhardt in the same room at the same time. And we have my good friend Nick Redfern here, um, all the way from Arlington. All the way from Arlington. You, you, you can tell he's got an Arlington accent. Yeah. <laughs> he does have an Arlington accent. But they're going to give a unique presentation. This is not anything they're going to be talking about tomorrow. Uh, they co-authored a book called Monsters of Texas that covers every strange creature from the state. So feel free to talk about anything that you guys aren't talking about tomorrow. Any of the other monsters. From Texas. From Texas. <laughs> and, uh, and they are open to uh, answer a few questions. Uh, we've gotten to about 9 o'clock and we've got to clear out. But uh, cut loose. Thanks for coming out, guys. Appreciate it. Thank you. Huh? Okay. Um, sure. So as Craig mentioned, Texas obviously... Uh, has a number of monsters, uh, cryptids, if you want to get technical, uh, weird creatures and legends and stuff, uh, the fitting of the great size and scope of Texas. Uh, so back in 2010, Nick and I decided to we better jump on this idea and collaborate on a book, uh, Monsters of Texas, since we're both living here in Texas and had an opportunity to investigate different things, well, sometimes together, but oftentimes differently. So um, uh, I'm going to start with um, Big Bird. We're not talking about Sesame Street, guys. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is entirely different. Big Bird is one of the oft-neglected cryptids or monsters in Texas lore. And uh, Big Bird is a man-sized flying creature, winged creature, that has been reported. And primarily back in the year 1976, Big Bird actually got so much press in, 1970, in the first month of 1976, January, that it made international news. It was like worldwide news uh, as far as you know, Germany, Japan, and, and worldwide because there were newspaper reports of these sightings of this giant winged creature. Now, the sightings began actually on New Year's Day, 1976. Two young girls down in Harlingen, Texas, which is very, you know, very close to the, the border with Mexico, reported seeing this man-sized bird in their yard kind of leering at them. And then a week later, a gentleman named Alverco Guajardo claimed that this thing slammed into the side of his mobile home, and when he went out to investigate, it was kind of standing there squawking at him, and he said that it looked like, uh, like a bird, but not a bird, like nothing from this planet. Wow. And then on January 14th, the most famous encounter involved a man named Armando Grimaldo, and this was up in Raymondville, Texas. We're still kind of in the same area, in the southern, very southern portion of Texas. And he was actually out smoking a cigarette on his... Uh, his wife's, uh, or his estranged wife's uh, porch, and he claimed that this thing came down from above and actually attacked him and ripped his clothes. And he kind of scattered to get away from it, and he actually had to be hospitalized at the Willis County Hospital, and he was in a state of shock. So this was just the first three accounts, but uh, for, for weeks and, uh, you know, days and weeks after that, there were a number of accounts or sightings of this creature. Now, some people described it as looking like kind of a big condor. They said it was a feathered, like bird-like creature with a bald head. But other people described something with bat-like wings and kind of an ape-like face. So there are a number of theories as to what the big bird was. Some people thought it might have been like a giant bat, an unknown species of bat. Um, the final uh, encounter occurred over San Antonio, Texas on Valentine's Day, uh, 1976, when three school teachers claimed that they saw these two enormous winged creatures um, flying over the road on their way to school one morning. And they got out of their cars and actually looked at these things, and they were all convinced that what they saw were pterodactyls, which of course are these giant winged reptiles that were contemporary with the dinosaurs. So those were most of the reports occurred in the year 1976, and I've actually written a book about Big Bird that I'll have for sale tomorrow, but um, there continue to be reports of Big Bird uh, all around Texas. Uh, in fact, I was telling Nick, just two weeks ago, a, a gentleman that owns a radio station in Austin contacted me and said that one of his employees was uh, essentially chased by a giant bat-winged creature with an ape-like face about two weeks ago as she was leaving work one night. Um, so there's many, many accounts and many sightings of this giant-winged creature over Texas. So, um, yeah, Big Bird. Mm -hmm. Nick, yeah, well, on the cover. Yeah, sure. Well, one of the other ones we got on the cover 
is what's less well known become or known as the Blue Dogs, but far more famously known as the Texas Chupacabra. And there's a lot of sort of misconceptions about what the Texas Chupacabra actually is or isn't. And um, the story sort of goes back about 10 years thereabouts when people started to see these weird, hairless, dog-like animals. And before anybody really did any research, we had pictures turning up on the internet and it kind of looked like some sort of giant rat, the best way to describe it. And people were in a lot of you know, strange situations in terms of trying to figure out what it is or what it wasn't. Um, and unlike this sort of more famous original chupacabra from Puerto Rico in the 1990s, we actually um, were able to get our hands on a number of corpses, there's one, um, of these animals, so we could check the DNA. And the DNA turned out to be, for the most part, from coyotes. And in some cases, coyotes mixed with dogs, uh, also with wolves. Was it maybe Mexican wolves, one or two? Mexican yeah, wolves. Yeah, Mexican wolves. And, um, but they look weird because they were totally hairless. Now, the skeptics and the debunkers have said, well, all they are is just mangy coyotes and nothing else. But they're actually not. They're not an unknown species, but there is some strange things going on with them. For example, um, the issue of mange. It doesn't sound like regular mange that they're suffering from, where, for example, the hair is often lost in tufts. So, you know, you have patches here, patches there. And it also causes the animals a lot of irritation. Um, but what we're not seeing is when the irritation occurs on regular coyotes, you know, they're scratching to the point where they cause infections because they're literally clawing their skin off almost. We're not seeing that with these animals. It's almost as if they're developing hairlessly, naturally. Um, and of course the big question is why should that be the case? In some reports, they seem to have like a large overbite. You know, the, the top jaw and the bottom jaw should be uniform, but they're sort of like that, maybe an inch or so or more. In some cases, they're developing these weird pouches <coughs> on their hindquarters, on their hind legs. And again, there's different theories as to what these pouches might be. But when you sort of put the pouches together with the overbite, with the mange that actually isn't mange, and various other things as well, like for example, a lot of them are seen during the day. You know, regular coyotes tend to come out at night and hunt, but you know, so many have been seen <coughs> around the fields and the roads down by Austin and San Antonio, particularly um, during daylight. So we're seeing something that is a regular animal that seems to have been mutated very, very quickly. Because the one argument that the the skeptics are unable to provide a good, valid answer for is why is it we've only been seeing these things really in large numbers since 2004? Why weren't we seeing, you know, dozens of them in 1994 or 84 or 74? And we weren't. So clearly something's going on. Now, me and Ken have sort of had a debate on this as to should they actually be called the Chupacabra or not? Um, but the name's obviously stuck and it's become sort of famous. So you know, I, I don't have a problem with them being called Chupacabra. But um, so we, we're dealing with something which is an aspect of, I guess an aspect of cryptozoology in the sense that we don't really know why these mutations are going on. But you've got a, an interesting scenario that might explain the, the mutations, don't you? Yeah. Um I was doing some investigation up a place called Fayetteville, Texas, where there have been a number of these animals uh, photographed and, and seen. And the gentleman who owns the property out there also noticed that all of his pecan trees were dying. And the, the pecan trees dying, he related to an actual coal-burning power plant that was very close. You can actually see it from his property, blowing these black clouds of smoke into the air. And he has a, a litigation stuff going against the plant because when he cut sections out of the pecan trees, you could actually see black rings around the outside that corresponded with the amount of time that the coal burning power plant had been there. So I ended up making a chart where all the, and a lot of the studies, as he said, have been down near Quero, Texas, and some of these other areas. But lo and behold, a lot of the, the hot spots where these blue dogs have been sighted, these chupacabras, coincide with locations of coal burning power plants, which emit huge amounts of sulfur dioxide and lead and all kinds of contaminants into the air. So I'm not trying to scare you guys, but it almost seems like a weird science fiction scenario where you've got these mutations 
that you know maybe a result of some kind of pollute, pollution or you know some some damage to the ecosystem. Perhaps. Yeah, because sulfur dioxide is what's called a mutagen, and probably the most famous mutagen or well known is mercury. And you know if, if mercury gets into the the system of a you know a pregnant woman, for example, I mean it can cause disastrous deformities. Um, so with um, sulfur dioxide being a mutagen, it's not impossible that these animals could be affected and, and that's why they're changing. I mean, there was a famous case uh, from the 1990s in a particular pool in Minnesota where a bunch of frogs, obviously on a smaller scale, but a, a, like a colony of frogs had all been affected by a mutagen there and they were developing extra eyes, extra limbs, and they were actually functioning limbs as well. So, in other words, it wasn't like some sort of mutation where the creature just was unable to move around or anything like that. It actually incorporated the mutations into its, its, its sort of day-to-day -day activities, if you like. So, uh, I think we could be dealing with a mutagen. We don't know all the answers, but, um, you know, we're getting there. Well done. Um, I'm going to talk about something that's a little bit... Um, esoteric that we don't hear about a lot. And this is sightings of, well, we know Texas uh, produces a lot of dinosaur fossils, right? There's some fossilized dinosaur tracks down where I live in San Antonio and of course Glen Rose and other places. Big Bend National Park has produced a lot of dinosaur fossils. But would you believe there are, and specifically man-sized bipedal dinosaurs that are very similar to the velociraptors in Jurassic Park? Now, most of the accounts are very ambiguous and they come from Big Bend National Park where they're referred to as the mountain boomers. And there are several kind of secondhand stories about people seeing these mountain boomers on the road, fe feasting on roadkill and so forth. Um, these are potentially connected to sightings of similar creatures from Colorado and New Mexico known as the river dinos. And a colleague of mine, Nick Suchik, has actually investigated accounts of these sightings of these, you know, and we're not saying they're dinosaurs per se, but people are describing them as reptilian and running around on their hind legs with a long tail and a long thin neck and a small head, which sounds very similar to some of the, the bird-like dinosaurs um, at the end of the Cretaceous. And um, again, quite recently, I actually, um, a colleague of mine, Lon Strickler, who runs the Phantoms and Monsters website, turned over some accounts to me of um, some people down in Hebronville, Texas, which is kind of down in South Central Texas. A woman actually claimed that she saw a quote-unquote dinosaur running across the road in front of her car one night. And uh, lo and behold, um, in response to that, there was a family that, that messaged Lon that saw the, the article and said, well, we've had these things on our property and they've been scaring our dogs. And they've actually had to take, um, according to them, measures to kind of protect their property and put up fences and things like that. So, you know, this is pretty rare as far as cryptozoology goes. Now, I'm not suggesting that dinosaurs are alive and well in Texas, you know, but we, you know, you have to look at some type of alternative theory. Is there some type of large reptile perhaps that's you know unknown to science uh, certain reptiles are known to or certain lizard species are known to actually run on their hind legs when they're moving at a very fast speed so there's the potential there that maybe these are misidentifications of a very large reptile lizard that's running around on its hind legs but um, uh, you've got to love the, the, the idea the possibility at least that we could have some kind of giant Reptilian <laughs> man sized creature running around in the deserts of Texas. So. Yeah. Or uh, what's that? Valley of the. Guanji. Valley of the Guanji, one of my favorite Ray Harryhausen movies where they find the dinosaurs in the, in the valley. Yeah. Well, I guess another one that's sort of equally as weird as upright reptiles is werewolves in Texas. And um, I actually, believe it or not, I've got a few reports of people who claim to have seen something that looks like the typical image that people have of werewolves. Now, I should stress, I've never spoken to anybody who claims to have seen a creature like at the full moon where somebody bursts out of the clothes and turns into like a werewolf. I'm, I've never been given even a single story like that. But the stories that I have been given are of people seeing what looks like a large wolf much larger than a normal wolf, and that when it's confronted them, or they've confronted it, it's raised itself up onto its hind legs, briefly, as if it has the ability to sort of, not sort of, you know, in the movies, run around on two legs, but to raise itself up, almost in a form of, um, you know, to scare and intimidate the person. 
And the, the reports from Texas, I've probably got now about 15 or 16 reports, um, predominantly from the um, sort of out bordering with Louisiana, and um, no sort of, no cases from West Texas. I don't know if Ken's got any from, from uh, South Texas. Well, there's the Converse werewolf from Yeah, the Converse werewolf, yeah, that's a good and the, one. And the Devils. From Del Rio? Yeah. The devil. Yeah, there's a couple of cases, but most of the ones I've got are pretty much from, you know, so as I said, bordering towards Louisiana. And what's interesting is that many of these reports kind of follow the same path as, if you know, Linda Godfrey's research into what's called the Michigan Dog Man. And again, it's like a, a wolf like animal that the term dog man kind of makes it sound like something, you know, out of Hollywood, but it actually isn't. It is more like a wolf that has the ability to rear itself up. Now, I have no real, real way to explain these reports at all. Um, the witnesses come across as very, very credible. You know, they don't sound like people just making it up. And what's interesting, we've seen more and more of these reports. And um, whether or not there could be some sort of wolf that can raise itself on its hind legs, on its hind legs, I don't know. But there actually is an animal that could do that, which almost fits the bill. And um, it's reputedly extinct today, but a lot of researchers think it's still around, and it's called the thylacine. And the thylacine was a creature that was found on New Guinea, in Australia, and various other places. And it was actually a marsupial, that's to say, like a kangaroo, it carried its young in a pouch. Uh, but it looks like a cross between a German shepherd and a tiger. Um, and it literally has sort of like stripes on its back like a tiger. And it could open its jaws almost like a, a snake. You imagine, you know, how wide a snake can get its jaw. If you look on the internet, you can find film footage of a thylacine literally like yawning. And the mouth goes like that. I mean, it's almost vertical. Is that Tasmanian devil? Yeah, yeah. Tasmanian well, Tasmanian tiger, tiger. yeah. But um, what's interesting is that the thylacine could raise itself up on its hind legs and briefly run along in a strange hopping movement. So it makes me wonder if there could be some sort of unknown animal in the US that has wolf-like qualities to it, but has the ability to briefly stand up and sort of hop along a little bit. Um, and we don't know what it is, you know. So uh, I think it's been labeled as a werewolf, if you like, but I think when you look at the reports, there's, there are credible reasons as to how it might really exist. Um, yeah, it's a good one. Werewolves. Mm -hmm. um, aquatic cryptids. Um, surprisingly, Texas doesn't have a lot of accounts of uh, lake monsters. We don't have anything like the Loch Ness monster, Lake Champlain monster, and so forth. Um, Sorry to steal your thunder, Lyle. There is a, a, a sighting of a giant giant catfish. There are the accounts of these giant car-sized catfish that live in reservoirs down near dams and stuff, of course. Uh, there's one actually very close to here, Lake of the Pines, known as Oscar. It's like a, supposedly a giant Volkswagen-sized catfish that lives in the lake. Um, there are some nefarious old accounts of quote-unquote sea serpents that were reported in, in old newspapers around the turn of the the 19th century. Now, most of those are pretty fabulous when you read the descriptions of these 200 foot long striped sea serpents with rattlesnake like tails. And, and you know, of course, those of us that are into cryptozoology and, and uh, other anomalous phenomena understand that many of the newspaper articles from that time period were obviously fictional and they were designed solely to sell newspapers. So we can't really put too much credibility behind those. But, one of my favorite um, aquatic cryptids in Texas is known as the Carvana Monster. And uh, this was re uh, referred to by the, the great French author Alexandre Dumas. Uh, he was writing about an explorer that was uh, in Texas in the 1830s and came across these um, accounts of these giant turtle-like monsters that lived in the mud and then actually uh, would attack and kill people's horses when they were riding through the swampy areas. And uh, the description was that these, these monsters, sometimes when these ponds would dry up, they would find these giant turtle-like carapaces uh, that were 10 to 12 feet long. And the descriptions of the head and the tail of the animal were described very similar to an alligator. So in essence, what it sounds like people are describing are, are a giant variation of a known species, of course, which is the alligator snapping turtle, which is a big, nasty turtle. And I'm sure many of you have run across those, particularly in the, uh, the bottoms of Texas. They typically can weigh, you know, 
couple hundred pounds and maybe be five feet in length. So um, potentially there are, you know, some monster size, or perhaps in the past there were some monster sized versions of these alligator snapping turtles. Um, in our book, we, there is one modern account uh, that we included a, a gentleman that was driving his car at a place called uh, Louisville near Dallas, and he claimed that he saw this giant turtle crossing the road that far exceeded any turtle that was uh, known to science. So, uh, but other than that, not really a lot of uh, aquatic cryptids. Nick, can you think no, of anything else? Um, I think, you know, like you said, catfish could explain some cases. And I think also alligator gar, which, you know, very weird looking fish if you've never seen an alligator gar. Or even if you have seen one, they're still weird. Um, but, um, I mean, there are some photographs you can find on the internet from like a hundred years ago where they are bigger, than, you know, significantly bigger than people report today. So maybe further back in the past than that, you know, we could have been talking about 14, 15 foot long alligator gar, which over time could have developed, you know, legends developed and it becomes, you know, the local river monster or the lake monster when it's actually just an oversized gar. And I think a lot of, um, particularly water-based cryptids, I think a lot of those could just be oversized versions of something that we, we know. I mean, for example, one of the theories for the Loch Ness Monster um, is that they're giant eels. Uh, it's an interesting theory. I mean, how much validity it actually has, that's, you know, there's a lot of questions and things for it and things against it. But I mean, I guess if you were faced with a 30 foot long eel charging at you and his body's this wide, you probably wouldn't argue with it being a monster. You know? <laughs> it's still going to be considered a monster. So um, I think that term monster, you know, sort of creates a lot of imagery in people's minds when, that, when in reality they're either unknown animals or just large versions of, of known animals. Uh, the Houston Batman, and again, we're not talking about the Cape Crusader or anything, but uh, this is a great story. It's kind of linked in a lot with ufology and, um, you know, anomalous phenomenon in general, but um, back in 1953, June 18, 1953, three people were sitting out on the back patio of their home in Houston, Texas. They didn't have air conditioning, and it was a very hot summer night, so they were sitting out on the patio. They couldn't sleep. Suddenly, they saw these sh giant shadow kind of crossing a across the, the, the street lights, and as they watched this shadow, it kind of landed into the, on the branch of this large old pecan tree. And as they kind of, as their eyes got adjusted to the darkness, they, they could make out the shape of what they described as a man-like form with bat-like wings. And what's really odd is that this creature, whatever it was, seemed to be wearing a tight-fitting, what they called a paratrooper-type costume, including <laughs> knee-length boots and a helmet. And he actually had a halo of dull light around him as well. And they watched him for several minutes until the light began to fade out and this figure just disappeared. And a few minutes later they saw this, or they claimed they saw this torpedo-shaped object shoot up into the air from across the street. So uh, the, the woman who owned the property, Hilda Walker, was so terrified that she contacted the Houston police the very next morning and it consequently made the newspaper. So the Houston Batman has long been linked to sightings of the Mothman, which I'm sure many of you heard of in West Virginia. Uh, John Keel, uh, you know, the author of Mothman Prophecies, kind of first gave the Houston Batman a lot of notoriety, but it's just kind of one of those weird creatures. Uh, we don't really have any follow-up sightings or anything that I'm aware of, but... Um... No, you get that occasionally, where just a really weird case, and a weird creature, and it's never seen again. It's just like a one-off thing, and that was pretty much like with the Houston Batman as well. Guys, we could probably field a couple of questions if you yeah. know. Yeah, Ken, yes, regarding uh, the Cape Cod, has any vocalization ever been recorded as well? That's a great question. I'm not aware of anyone ever describing a vocalization. But, you know, what's interesting is Nick indicated the people that have encountered these animals are people, mostly ranchers and people that have grown up around coyotes and other indigenous Texas predators for years. And unlike coyotes, as Nick said, these animals are very brazen. They'll come out during the daylight, they challenge people, they don't seem to be fearful of people, so their behavior patterns are very abnormal. But no, I've never heard of anyone describing a, a sound or a vocalization. There's a video on YouTube, somebody captured one and it's gnawing on the cage. Mm. Can you hear it? Oh, uh, I think you're referring to the, the Chupa Raccoon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll give a that video, but you can kind of tell. Tell by looking at the hands the way that it's. <laughs> <laughs>
wondering, you animated when you were talking about the Chupacabra, and of course one of the shows that I'd seen said that it was a hybrid, like you said, out of a Mexican wolf and dog and this and that. Bringing up environmental concerns, do you think this is enabling uh, Mother Nature to take these courses where maybe different breeds can enter breed, or is it is that some of the environmental factors making things get bigger? Well, that kind of thing. I mean, you think there's a connection there? Well, I think I think the important thing to note is that if even if it's done by mutagens, you know, that's that's actually making them physically change. It's almost as if it's been done in a way where it's not causing them any disadvantages. You know, it's not like it's a handicap to them. They seem quite comfortable running around without without any hair. But it's a genetic path that it's just taken. Yeah, and it seems to have happened very, very quickly. As I said, you know, we should have had reports 10, 15 years ago of the same amount. But, and when reports are spreading up through um, Oklahoma. Um, funnily enough, I... Um, I investigated a case in Oklahoma in 2010 with Fox News, there have been reports up there. And we went out and um, interviewed a guy named um, is it Craig? Ryan Craighead. And uh, you can actually find his photograph. If you Google Chupacabra plus Ryan Craighead, um, you'll see the photograph that he took of this hairless animal. And, and, it, and even that is sort of running on its hind legs. It's sort of got this weird hopping movement. It looks very strange. And, uh, you, you can find that in, you know, on the internet quite easily. So, in other words, whether it's nature making some sort of spontaneous change or a mutagen, it's work. I wouldn't say it's working for the animals, but it's definitely not working against them. Could that come for other? Well, that are now being more. Well, I mean, you do get. There have been some reports from Russia where they've got these sort of hairless dogs developing as well. So, I mean, you know, it's. That might be something totally unconnected, just coincidental, or it might not be. I should point out that when you have, uh, scientifically speaking, when you have two distinct species right. that can interbreed, right. it typically creates uh, sterility in the offspring. So they're not therefore going to be able to simply sprout up with a new species because two animals, you know, certain species, obviously, lions and tigers, that's been done in captivity, zebras and mules, things like that. Uh, coyotes and... and uh, Domestic dogs are close enough genetically and wolves to all interbreed, but it's not a viable genetic path after that. It's not going to suddenly spring up and turn to something else. It's probably just kind of a genetic bottleneck that's going to end right there. Uh, on that same line, I'm from Fayette County, and more by what you, you believe, that is very true because people that I knew as a kid are dying because of that power plant. So there is you know, stuff going on from that power plant. So. It's very sad. Did you have questions? Oh yes, yeah, so I was wondering, okay, would Big Bird be related in any way at all for the Thunderbirds that we've seen around the United States? Yes, absolutely. And um, Thunderbirds is actually one of my main focuses of research. So, And I do collect accounts from all over North America, but what's really befuddling is I seem to have two distinct categories. A lot of people describe them as looking like giant raptor types of birds, like essentially like a giant vulture or eagle or a condor type of bird. But then other people describe it, what they see, and they describe it as a thunderbird, as specifically looking like a pterodactyl, you know, which is a flying reptile, not a bird at all. Now, we're learning a lot through paleontology, we're learning that the, the archaic model that we had of pterodactyls as flying reptiles is changing because, for example, um, they had these kind of rudimentary feather type coverings, many of them called pycnofibers. So a pterodactyl, rather than being kind of the, the smooth, leathery, bat-winged creature that we're used to seeing in movies, they probably looked a lot more like birds than people realize because they had this kind of, these proto-feathers or this feather-like covering, some of them did. So it's a very, uh, it's very frustrating as a researcher because it's hard to, you know, to develop an archetype as to what the, these Thunderbirds could be because the, the, the descriptions vary so much. Is there her anything about Bigfoot? Oh, yes. <laughs> and we, Are I, you I guys going to be signing we, we, copies of those tomorrow? I, yes, time? absolutely. Nick and I would both be happy to sign these. And um, I, I guess we, we probably intentionally 
avoided Bigfoot because there's going to be a, a healthy dose of Bigfoot over the next day or so. And there are going to be a lot of good lectures. But yes, Texas ranks, I believe, um, in the top 10. Is that fair to say, Craig? Maybe number 7 or 8 in the, in the lower 48 in terms of the number of Bigfoot accounts. So I think that's one of the reasons. I'm sorry? Reported Bigfoot sightings. Reported Bigfoot sightings. We don't know how many. Probably one in ten gets reported as that. Yeah. That's true. So, you know, after the Pacific Northwest, California, Oregon, Washington State, and then you have Ohio and Florida with the skunk ape have a lot of sightings. And I think Texas is right there in terms of the volume of sightings. And, of course, the majority of those sightings are right here where we are in the, the far eastern quadrant of the state. So we do write, Nick and I did cover a number of Bigfoot sightings in Texas, including the Lake Worth Yep. Monster, Goat Man, which is probably the most iconic Bigfoot type figure in the state. So, absolutely. Oh, well, I was just going to ask you, have, do y'all get a roll out of reports from West Louisiana on the Texas border? You know, I hear about the big thicket. What's it oh, yeah. On the edge of the big thicket? <laughs> yeah. Toledo Bend area? Yes. Yes, lots of sightings from Western Louisiana. Uh, okay. And Arkansas. And Southern Oklahoma. Is the, the, the Where the four, four states come together. Yep. Yeah. They are both yeah. Maybe. Don't forget Oklahoma. Don't leave Oklahoma. Oh, yes, yes. Arthur Well, that concludes tonight's presentation. Like I said, I want to thank everybody for coming out.